This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, hello, and jumbo, jumbo, everyone, and welcome to our sunset drive today. We'll be coming to you both from the Mara Triangle in Kenya and the Kruger National Park in South Africa. And you've got beautiful elephants there starting our afternoon drive. And what Man is trying to show you is also a nice sausage tree right in front of you there. And I think below that tree, you can see very, very flat lions because it's not only only warm it is hot and that translates to 32 degrees Celsius and 90 degrees Fahrenheit as usual my name is David nothing has changed and the me this afternoon with my younger brother Manu Manu how are you sir mm -hmm. remember our drive is always very interactive so questions comments as usual hashtag safari live on Twitter and of course you can keep following us on the YouTube chat stream now interesting to show you to show you these lions here which are just of course in the shade because as I said it's not only warm but hot anytime we get 30 degrees Celsius here 90 degrees Fahrenheit for us is pretty warm you should see me in my shorts and man who also have some shorts and a very light t-shirt just trying to fight the heat and talking of this sausage tree here it's not the very normal tree I've been talking about for many many months because look at the fruits hanging there those fruit are what you call the sausages because they take the shape of a sausage as much as they got nothing to do with the sausages that we eat. You all know my favorite pride of lions is called the sausage tree pride. But apparently the pride down here, it's not my favorite pride. It's a different pride that is called the salt lake. To see them here is quite something. And I think one of them had me call his name. Yes. And maybe it's just trying to farm. To me, truly, this is the sausage pride. And I have counted three young males and five females. And you can see why it's hot. And that one, to me, looks like Kipuli. Manu, do you agree? It looks like Kipuli to me. And this would be a very interesting combination. Look at him. And definitely, no doubt, that is Kipuli. We have been with these lions here the last couple of, what, 10, 15 minutes? And we have been trying to digest or to know who they are by virtue of the location they are in. And the guy who just went down there is Kipuli. The last we saw Kipuli, me and Manu, Kipuli was alone and he fought two nomadic males and he did a very good job. Now, recently, we saw him again and he was with one youngster, one male, and not the other. And that one male he was with had been battered and had scars all over. But now we are seeing him with two other young males and five girls. Interesting. I think the dynamics here are changing every few months. And what we need to do is to find out, is it because of scarcity of food or is Kipuli getting other brothers and arms? You know, uh, uh, getting more arms so that he can be able to defend a bigger territory. And now we want to see that young male there that is scratching itself to find out if this is the male I saw earlier that was about two months ago. Not sure I was with Manu, but I think he could be the one. And yes, he is. He had many scars. And if you look carefully on his right, you can see the scar. Yes, definitely that is uh, the other. The male that is so, and I think uh, his scars have since healed. And I'm sure M told me to take you to South Africa. I'm not sure who will be taking to you, but I think whoever it is, she or he will say how hot it is in Juma. Indeed, David, it is very warm, which is why we too are wearing shorts. Craig, are you wearing shorts? Yes, Craig is also wearing shorts. So we're wearing shorts in unison with David. Now, of course, driving like that is not very clever. So let's stop doing that before we have an accident. My name is Tristan, like David said, and on camera I do have Craig this afternoon. And it is a very warm welcome to all of you. And I say warm because it is swelteringly hot. It feels like there is somebody with an oven door and a fan blowing it at all the heat at us at the moment. So we're really very, very warm. But it's okay. It's good for, for the animals later in the day. So now they'll mostly be in the shade. But a little bit later on, 
might drive them to come out and have a little drink of water. So that's going to be our plan for the afternoon is we're going to go and check all the little water points in the hope that we can find some animals drinking. We might get lucky with some elephants or potentially even a leopard, which is probably what we're going to try and focus on this afternoon. So that's the kind of plan for now. When it is very hot like this, if they're not at water, then generally they're going to be in the shade, which makes things a little more tricky to find because the grass at the moment, as you can see on both sides of me, and even the bush itself, um, is quite thick. And so what that means is that it's very difficult for us to see. It's not like where David is in the Masai Mara, um, where it's very open and while the grass is long, there's not too many trees. Here in South Africa, um, this area, it gets very, very dense and very thick, and that makes it quite tricky to find the animals sometimes. So looking for water points is probably our best bet in finding what we are looking for. Do you agree, Craig? Craig agrees, he concurs. Excellent. Well done, Craig. It's going to be, hopefully we'll also get some birds at some of the water holes. It's a nice time to um, find little waders because we've had a bit of rain over the last few months and so there's small little kind of water points where you find birds that like to hunt little insects and things. They spend a bit of time there too. So water is definitely the name of the game this afternoon. Good. Now I'm not the only one here in South Africa. We have my friend Trish. She's also out and about and I think she's also joined the struggle and is in a pair of shorts of her own. Hello everybody and good afternoon. Welcome to the Sunset Safari. I always get it wrong. But I am Trishala and I have Sev on camera with me. Hello. And of course, remember we're 100% interactive, so please use the hashtag Safari Live and of course the YouTube chat stream to communicate with us and let us know what you think, what you'd like to see today in this heat. It's scorching. I think it was 35 degrees, Emma. 35 degrees Celsius, but 95 or so Fahrenheit. So it's really, really hot. So Tristan's plan is a very, very sassy today. He's walked past me and pulled my earpiece out. So I think he deserves it. Should I do mine in the meantime while we drive about? Rub it. Rub, rub it. Rub it. <laughs> That's as good as it gets for me. But uh, I don't know if Tristan can do any better. Well, we'll see. Well, we know we had Tlalamba this morning. So Tristan says that he might have a look. <laughs> he might have a look. But all you guys are saying it was a delicate frog noise. Well, thank you. I'm a delicate kind of woman, I hope, apart from my savage injuries that I constantly seem to get. <laughs> I'm sporting a new injury today, everybody. Would you like to see it? Same leg as the, as the broken foot, but it's my new injury. There it is. Can you see? New injury. It looks a lot more hectic than it actually is, I promise. I um, I'm always looking for someone to play tennis with constantly that is my I, I, you just see me bouncing about with my tennis racket saying can I have some friends can I have some friends play tennis with but then I also realize that I've only got one racket so it doesn't actually make sense but I've decided now to play against the FC wall since FC has moved to Johannesburg and I can't, don't have to disturb anybody. And then I slipped on the gravel and the stones just scraped me. So nothing hectic. Just thought I'd cover it up for game drive. <laughs> but I'm glad I could still be a delicate frog, even in my um, not so delicate body at the moment. Even the breeze is warm at this point. Ah, well, it is time. Remember mine? Rub it. Rub it. No, that was too much. Rub it. Rub it. So now I'll send you over to Tristan, see if he can do any better.
No, 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 not just yet, Trishala. Good things come to those who wait. It's still too early in the drive. We need to gather momentum and we need to keep everybody interested until later in the day for two reasons. One, is that one has to warm up one's vocal cords as a frog and generally frogs don't call at this time of the day they call at night and so we're going to wait for the sun to start going down for that sake the second thing is that just now we are going to have our swell not just now at the end of the drive will be our school drive and i think it will be really fun to get all the kids involved as well and make them also do some frog calls so we'll keep it for then um, and probably also not a bad idea for all of you to actually make some frog calls at home and you can post your video of your frog call on hashtag safari live or at fc um, so do that and then we'll see who has the best frog call by the end of it it'll be quite funny to see everybody's calls but I'll do mine sort of at the start of, of kids drive I think that's when I'm going to do it and then we'll rope in David as well and Trishala well she's going to have to do another one um, she, she unfortunately went too early and now is going to have to suffer the consequences of jumping the gun and having to do now another frog call. She can't just do the one, she has to now do another one. You're gonna test Trishala as to how many frog calls she actually knows, which will be interesting. Um, but yes, we'll do one a little bit later. And actually be quite nice to do a bit of frogging. I think maybe for the kids' drive, we'll have to lose our shoes and socks and maybe go do a little bit of wading in one of the wallows and see if we can actually find a little froggy somewhere. So, Sinak, what frogs do we find in the Sabi Sands? Well, we, there's quite a few frogs in the Sabi Sands. Um, I think it's 20, if I'm not mistaken, 28 species. I might be wrong. Uh, it might be more than that, so I'll, I'll double check. But the most common ones that we'll see here is, um, in terms of frogs would be painted reed frog, um, water lily frog, leaf fold, well, golden leaf folding frog you do get, but not as common, um, banded rubber frog, uh, foam nest tree frog, um, painted reed did I say painted reed I think I said painted reed common caco um, what else would we have tremolo sand frog we get here um, snoring puddle frog we get here as well um, oh, there's lots there's quite a few different species and then in toads the most common toad that we see here well there's two there's red toad and eastern olive that we see a lot of and we also see raucous toad as well in this area so there's quite a lot of different species of toads and frogs um, hopefully we can find at least one generally we struggle at this time of the year because the conditions haven't really been great so the last two world frog days we haven't really gotten it right because it has been quite dry and cold actually in those periods whereas now it's actually a little bit of water don't fly if you fly you're going to be in trouble there's a bird there that I want to show you, but it's going to fly, isn't it? There's a crested barbet that is sitting quite nicely out in the open. Generally, you don't get them as open as this. They often sit in thicker, denser areas. Craig, can you see it? Oh, you can. It does. No, there's a crested barbet closest to, uh, closer to us on this tree right here. So, there we go. So, there's our crested barbet. Beautiful, beautiful bird with, obviously, lots of bright colors. It's got yellows and reds and blacks and whites and and now it's going to fly off into the shade where it won't look nearly as pretty as what it did on the edge of the tree in the sunlight but fairly common you get them a lot in this area um, hear them quite regularly um, which is quite nice now before we send you up to david and the lions in the shade there's some animals just in front that are going to run away as soon as i start so before they kind of disappear i'm just going to show you them quickly there's a warthog with her piglets on the other side of the dam wall and unfortunately they generally do run away i'm actually quite surprised that we managed to even get a view of them because the ones that hang around twin dams um actually normally run away so nice to actually see this female with her little ones around and and as we said the story of the game is going to be finding water and areas where there's shades close to water and that's where hopefully most of the animals are going to be hanging out um, these warthogs undoubtedly have come towards twin dabs not only to drink but to mud wallow they're one of those creatures that wallows regularly you'll find they'll get into mud and they'll roll around and they'll cover their skin extensively in mud so pretty common species to find at this time of the day on a hot day close to water um, it's in, often you find them kind of glistening when you see them around this sort of time they don't really come around sunset they know that that's normally when predators are starting to get active and also it's time to head back to their little burrows where they're going to spend the evenings kind of sleeping 
Coast side, uh, that is a cute little family. There's a lot more than you actually think because there's, I saw four little piglets already go to the left behind all those bushes. So it looks like there's actually six or seven of them that are in this area at the moment, which is really, really nice. She means that this female has been very successful in raising her piglets, which is no mean feat in an area like this. We have a really predator-rich environment in the Savi Sands, particularly with leopard, and raising little piglets where there's a lot of leopards around is hard work. So she's a dedicated mom and a very good mother at this stage. She's managed to get those piglets past the most probably dangerous phase when they're very, very small, and they're susceptible to things like snakes and birds of prey, as well as um, leopards. Now, Daniel, did you say you call them elbow eaters? Well, I suppose that's a fairly accurate description of what they do, given that they will go down on their, what we would call elbows, um, to use their little snouts to dig up various roots and tubers, and so I suppose that's a fair enough nickname for them. Now, I'm going to try and just go a little bit further forward and see if maybe we get lucky and we'll be able to kind of see the whole family before they run away, although it looks like they're trotting down the road already so we'll just quickly have a quick glance and see if we can get the rest of them yes they're all coming down to the water craig look they, maybe they're going to have a little wallow for us wouldn't that be nice we need to get all our little piggies in a row so it's not three little pigs it's how many we got here one two three four five six little ones oh that's quite a quite a nice size litter that actually she's done very well to raise this many to this size already although I mean, these are still small enough that they would make a perfect snack for somebody like Tingana or even Tundi would be able to grab a warthog of this size. And look at the one that's now lying in the <laughs> in the mud itself. So I was saying they like to have a good wallow. And so what you'll find is they'll lie down and then they'll roll around. And in fact, all of them are doing it just to the left now. They've all found themselves a little spot and everybody's going to get cool by sort of plonking themselves down and, and having a really good wallow. It's one thing about warthogs is they are not shy of having fun in mud. They very much like some of their larger sort of counterparts out here, like things like rhinos and buffalo and that and illies that do this. Warthogs also seem to have a lot of fun when they do do it. Laura, it is very sweet. I, we often don't get to see these guys doing this. Like I said, generally very, very shy. So it's so nice to actually see a bunch of wallowing, bathing warthogs. Um, I'm just very, very jealous of them at this stage because Craig and I are sitting on Twin Dam's wall where there's not one iota of shade and we are being burnt to little crisps at the moment while these guys have a nice little swim. So it would be quite nice to actually go and join them and kind of roll around in the mud with them. And they look as though they're having the best time as they kind of lie on their sides and just cool off that body quite a bit. Now you can see the adults are a little bit more clever than the little ones. They'll drink first before they wallow. They know that once they start wallowing, they dirty the water quite quickly and drinking is then not going to be as pleasant. And so they'll rather kind of drink first and then they'll start to wallow down. But let's see if the adults do as well. I think they will eventually. Isn't it cool though? So not every day that we get to see them like this. In some areas, warthogs are very relaxed. That's generally close um, to human establishments where they get used to the movement of people. Um, <clears throat> most of the ones out here are, are quite flighty. Um, now, you can see the adults are just starting to kind of lie down and kind of get themselves in. And you see how they use the edge where there's a little bit of mud as well. So it's not only about using water to cool their body down, but it's also to try and just be able to coat themselves with that mud, which is ultimately going to, one, encase parasites that are potentially on their skin that they can then, once that mud dries, they can go and rub off and potentially pull parasites off. Second thing is, is that it's going to act as almost an exfoliant for their skin itself and just kind of help with getting rid of any dead bits of skin on them as well as just keeping everything in good condition and creating a bit of a layer between them and the sun, which theoretically should try and um, basically cool the body down a little bit. Um, Sinak, have I ever seen a crocodile attack a warthog? Uh, not personally, no. Um, I would imagine it has happened many times. I just personally haven't seen it. Uh, I've seen close though. I once, I suppose attack, yes. I've never caught a warthog. Um, at Chitra Dam, I once saw them come down. What's that? Is there a monitor getting out as well, Craig? In the middle of the screen. Oh, well done, Craig. I can't see a thing because there's so much glare, but apparently there's a monitor that's getting out of the way of all the warthogs as well. But back to the kind of croc and, and warthog. Oh, there it is. I see it moving. Well done, Craigie. Um, it's 
somewhere in there. There you see it, a little baby monitor moving across the sort of dongas and pits that have been made by bigger animals' feet. But crocodiles, I suppose, would go after warthogs if, if they got close enough. And I, at Chitwood Dam, I once saw a warthog come down and the croc tried to go from it, go for it, but it completely messed it up and it was way too early and the warthog trotted off. But I would imagine, yes, I would imagine quite a few little piglets get taken um, by crocs, but I've never personally seen it myself. Um, but I'm 99.9% .9 sure that there are recorded cases of it and most certainly there's probably footage of it somewhere or rather. But yes, hive of activity, Emma, you're right. There's Egyptian geese, there's warthogs, there's monitor lizards, there's terrapins. Um, there's all kinds of things um, around and that's just because of how warm it is. Natalie, do they learn to wallow because of their parents or is it just instinct? I would imagine a bit of both. Um, you know, the instinct obviously of drinking is there, so they would go towards water and they would watch the adults and how they go about things and then they would start to practice it. Um, they would also probably learn a few cues from the adults themselves as how adults approach water, that they, you know, a little bit kind of wary that they don't just go bounding in and kind of swimming around. You know, they'll, they'll probably have that little bit of learning from the adults in terms of where they position themselves, how deep they go, those kind of things. But the instinct to go to water is probably already there. Um, it's just the kind of perfecting the technique of doing it but you can see how they get in and then they lie down on their side and then they stand up and then they move about a bit and then they lie down on the other side and eventually the whole body will be coated and I'm sure that takes a little bit of kind of practice and a bit of learning and watching of the adults before they get it 100% right but that one adult looks very very happy it's kind of the one in front there it's got a little neck rest so it's got its head on the clay and is perfectly settled in this little wallow that it's made for itself on the edge of the dam. Very, very nice. Right, I think we're going to try and find some shade in order to watch these guys. We'll see if we can reposition um, because we're being baked. In the meantime, though, we're going to send you up to David, and I hope he's managed to find some shade while he watches his lions resting in their shade. Very well done, uh, Tristan. It's true. When it gets hot, everybody tends to go in the shed. If not, then having those pigs wallowing in the mud helps to bring the temperatures down as much as they would want to cover themselves with some sort of sunscreen. Well, my lions are still very flat here in the grass, and that definitely says how hot it is. And I've been trying to look at these dynamics here. You see that one particular male? He has been there since we got here. He's a youngster. I'm looking at him at about maybe, what, five, six years old? Because of the color, of course, of the mane and his uh, body physique, he's at the very base of that tree. And he seems to be having some blondy men. Not that I can remember him very well, but from what I have gathered, the three males plus the five females this definitely must be the Salt Lake Pride. But to have Kipuli amongst them is what is really intriguing for me because the last we saw Kipuli, he had two youngsters with him. And yeah, the last time before this last we saw him, uh, I think I was with Bunge, if I'm not very wrong. Bunge is one of the other camera operators. And then seeing him a month and a half ago with one of the youngsters I saw him with and not the other left me so many questions what could have happened to the other one so the one he was with was very battered as i said earlier had scars his nose was bruised uh his eyelashes seemed to have been bitten i don't know how that could have happened and right on the forehead he had a very big out a clomac now he's here and i think he has since recovered and if manu will swing a little bit to the right not sure that's where we are now we'll see those two males and the, the one the legs up, that to me is Kipuli. And Kipuli has been the force to reckon with in this particular territory. And next to him is the other young male um, talking about. I do not know what might have happened here, but I'm trying to imagine what Kipuli would want to do. He needs more brothers in arms to defend his territory. And if that's the case now, if that's the case, then he has the right combination because him, with two other youngsters, two other big males, he got a chance to fight while anybody else that could try and come and take these five girls here or even the girls of the sausage 
trip right. Well, today is the International Frog Day. I was reminded that by um, uh, in the final control. Many thanks. I'd forgotten that. But I just wish it was the International Toots Day because where I come from, we see more toots than frogs. So anytime we go to the gardens, uh, even if it's like grass, like the grass you see here, we'll always be tossing toots out of the ground. Not sure, not sure any that could be here because there's not much water here and of course there's too much uh, grass cover there could be no room for a frog or even a toad now you can see what difference a sh shade can do because this particular area under this tree what would happen is it gives it a very good shade and Catherine you have a very interesting question man will show you the kind of tree and you see those fruit hanging there the name of this tree is called the sausage tree. And just because the fruit you see hanging there take the shape of a sausage. Now, I'll tell you something interesting, Catherine. In the last uh, 30 or so minutes we've been here, we have had two of this fruit falling down. And on both occasions, they fell very close to the lions, but they have missed them. And we saw them, all of them shot up, boom, just like a bullet or granite that just fell so close to them. Now, this fruit could weigh anything from what, a kilogram to two kilograms? I'm talking about three or up to four and a half pounds, and that is not lightweight. Now, my worry is if any one of them would fall, fall on the head, of say, or the neck of a lioness, because the males at least have the mane on their heads, they are very well cushioned, should one of them fall on their heads. But I say it could be a very big bang on the head of one of them. Way back when we used to do safaris out there and we'd drive big trucks called overlanders, we'd look for a big tree like this one you see here, and we'd eat under the tree. And if unfortunately any of the fruit would just, you know, loosen up, even to have ripened and fall down, <whistles> either to get on your plate and toss your food in the air and you're down, no more food, or it would hit you on the head. And I can tell you, you could, you know, have a very swollen head, if not very painful one. Now, still thinking why Kipuli should have joined uh, these two other males here and these girls from the Salt Lake. But I would understand because between the Salt Lake territory and the Sausage Republic, and where we are now, there's a very huge vacant area that's not occupied by any other males. And if you can remember, there are two other males that we call the nomadic males, where we had them having a very big fight last year with Kipuli, and Kipuli sorted them very quickly. If any competition Kipuli would be facing, or now if this new coalition would be facing, would be those two males. Those two males, we saw them yesterday, and apparently there were three. They've always been moving together. And one of them have that very short tail, and it's got a wound at the very back. And that wound has not been healing. And my other friend, Lauren, might have seen them yesterday, I guess. And she easily thought it could be what we call uh, the Kichwa males, where we have one Kichwa male with a short tail. But that Kichwa male, or what you call, yeah, half tail or something, uh, its tail is healed. Whatever might have happened, it is healed. And I remember Lauren asking a very interesting question, or she made a comment. She would not have known what would have happened to that particular tail. Now, in the Mara, it's very common for us to see animals with half tails, be it lions, be it white hooks, and even elephants. Trying to remember the times I was in Juma in South Africa, I don't remember seeing any cat with a half a tail. I don't remember an elephant with a half a tail that I saw. And apparently way back, there's a particular area that we call the Gorge area near one of the camps uh, around here called the Angama Lodge. And there's a gorge there and there used to be a very famous leopard there that had a half tail also. And not very sure why we have all these animals having, you know, half tails and we have always heard of theories. They could have been bitten by something. It could have been an infection or it could have been something genetical. But I'm sure before long we'll be coming up uh, with an actual concrete idea what could have happened to all these animals because we still see them even today. Well, these lions to me look very flat as much as we've got elephants there from a distance that are more entertaining.
entertaining as elephants will be doing something. And for that reason, I would want maybe we, you know, bumble around, maybe come back here later when it cools off and maybe find out why Kipuli would be here. And as we do that in the meantime, we'll take you back to South Africa to Trish. Not sure she is anywhere near Chitradam. Favorite watering holes. Now, interesting that David was talking about how some animals can get bits of themselves bitten off by crocodiles when they come down to drink. Well, this guy right here is taking that risk at the moment. Now, we know for sure that there's crocs in here, but I don't see any at the moment. So that's how they probably realize that it's a bit safer. Come down here and have a bit of a drink. Look at that beautiful impala. And impala really is a really really beautiful antelope i think we get so carried away with all of the other sort of flagship animals the really pretty ones the really ferocious ones we forget that we have a fine oh what scared you now you'll find that they're really skittish around water and that goes for a lot of animals because water has the potential to bring danger like we were saying with the crocodiles and Kipuli and his tail. So you'll find that they're really, really kind of not 100% dedicated to the drink. <laughs> that was quite a spook it got there. There's another one having a bit of a drink there too. Always very vigilant. Oh, it looks like the other one's coming to spook it. Monique, you have a really interesting question. You'd like to know where the hippos would go if Chitwa had to dry up. Well, they'd have to find their nearest body of water. Now, obviously, Chitwa or any other watering hole doesn't just dry up at the drop of a hat it happens in stages and then see it happening and they need a requirement of about one and a half meters to actually uh, be able to for the water to be able to sustain them so they really need that kind of water level so if that drops to anywhere even even if it's just you know it drops to 1.5 and they can still be in there they will know at that point that things are not great and they will start to move to other areas and hippos I mean, we know that in the in the evening they'll move out to to graze of course and usually it's within uh, within four kilometers of uh, roughly of the watering hole that they're at or that they are uh, that is their territory but there are instances of hippos that have traveled really really long distances i remember reading about a hippo in saint lucia that had traveled i think 1800 kilometers or something like that to another watering hole so it's not outside of their ability to be able to travel vast distances to find water and that is the main aim he he or she or the hippo that is their their lifestyle it's like saying if something was in the water and they needed to get to land Ah, very interesting. I have also wondered this a lot. Many viewers are asking why Snorkel, Stare, Snorkel Sarah and Scuba Steve don't live here at Chitwa. I have um, a theory of how this might have happened. It's actually not very far away. Um, Chitwa and the Biffleshook watering hole, which is where um, Scuba Steve and Snorkel Stare, uh, Sarah live. But I have a feeling that maybe they came from Chitwa, it's a possibility. They could have come from Chitwa and then moved to to Bufalsuk. But really, there's no way to know for sure unless we had tagged individuals and we could actually track their movements. But remember, if Scuba Steve comes in here, I mean, the main question from Monique was why, are, why isn't Scuba Steve here? Well, if Scuba Steve had to come here, he'd have to fight he'd have to fight the dominant male that's here at the moment. And why would he do that when he has his own territory in Buffalo that he doesn't have to fight anybody for at the moment? There's some action going on there. So it all comes down to everybody wants to be the highest ranking. 
everybody wants to, to be on top, the high ranking individual. And to drop down, it's just not worth it. So that's why I think Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah have been down that end. And also, I don't know if, uh, if Scuba Steve has always liked that area and now he's gone. And I mean, when it dried up, he had to go. So all the water has been gone. So, you know, there's a whole lot of things you can talk about when it comes to those two. It's strange, they do so little, those two, but they are so intriguing. Hello, lovely water birds. Now, that's the next thing we're going to look at is some water birds. So while I get my binos out and have a good look, let me send you over to Tristan and see what he's got for you. Well, I don't know about trying to cool down. We're just kind of puttering along. It's hot wherever you are at this stage, whether you're in drainage lines or out in the roads. But we tried to move closer to our warthogs to try and see how they're doing and, well, to get a little bit kind of a better view and get some shade, but they ran away, unfortunately. So we left them there and then we checked the Mulwati just quickly to make sure that Tundi hasn't crossed further to the east, given that she was seen this morning. Um, but there's no tracks for her there. So the guys that actually saw her last are going into that area. So I'm going to leave this kind of space for them to go and scratch around and do their thing and see if they can find where they kind of left her and whether or not there is any sign of her at this stage. So we're heading kind of more northwards um, along vultures at the moment. We're going to head towards sort of where Columbo was left, roughly. Um, we're taking a bit of a detour to get there. We've been checking, like I say, the Muwati, and we'll check Hyena Road. Just there's some pans along Hyena Road that Columbo sometimes likes to use. I suspect, though, however, that she hasn't gone too far from that Gari Dam area. I think it's, it's so warm today that I would be very, very, very surprised if she's headed very far and has gone kind of far from where she was left because it got hot quite quickly this morning. Um, and so I'd imagine that she is in probably still somewhere in some shade kind of lying down. But we'll just double check anyway. It's worth kind of having a little look around. So we'll go up Paina Road and then round and come down sort of Gauri cut line area and scratch around and see what we get. Maybe also not a bad road this for if there is any buff on the property or if we get any ellies, they sometimes come around the side, come and have a bit of a mud wallow. So it's good to, to check. So I believe some of you are saying that Tandi is being very sneaky. Yes, she can be a sneaky one when she wants to be. Um, and she is being incredibly sneaky of late. Um, so hopefully that's a sign that maybe she's either starting to think about mating or she's figuring out where she can go in order to kind of start denning who knows i mean it's but she is being very 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 elusive of late um and so hopefully that's going to mean good things to come in that she starts to mate or has mated or something along those lines um and is just trying to kind of re-establish certain certain areas under her own sort of steam what's also interesting is this morning where she was seen is quite far to the west for tandy um, a lot further west than she has been of late. Um, Treehouse Dam area is not kind of where Tundi really spends most of her time. It's mostly to this eastern side. And so it's going to be interesting just to kind of see, is she marking that area out um, and in the hope that she's going to kind of push the Clalumba to that sort of section? Or is she starting to mark that out to make space for Clalumba on this eastern side? It's going to be just interesting to kind of see how it all plays out over the course of the next year or so it'll take probably about six months i think still until her and clalamba kind of separate and then clalamba's got to grow a little bit and establish herself and then we'll see kind of how this is all going to end up and how the two of them are going to be able to um kind of settle and figure out whose territory will lie where but will be an interesting kind of thing to see so hopefully we can find either one of them this afternoon and we can delve into it a little bit deeper in the meantime though back to Trish who had her binos out and I hope that she has spotted something of interest for all of you I have 
spotted something. Now I come to Chitwa fairly often and I know the general birds that are around here but I've seen this little guy and the last time I saw him was actually around the Drakensberg Mountains, the southern parts of the Drakensberg Mountains when I was with my family in January I think it was and that was a red knobbed coot. Oh, oh, Seb says there was a bit of action here. We had to move across quickly. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, playing. Those look like two little ones having a go at each other. <laughs> come up, come up. Oh, isn't that cute? Almost makes you want to jump in there with them. They're so cute and the water looks so good. And I am so toasty. <laughs> oh, look at those little ears. <laughs> Just sort of playing very cute. There is nothing like a baby animal by the water. It's actually quite busy. Of course, there are no lovely eddies and things coming down, but still quite busy at Chitwan. Lots going on. Oh, well, there's my back at my rob, robbed, nebbed, red knobbed coot. <laughs> that black one in there. I don't have a great look at him because he's quite an impressive looking thing. If I show you here, so this is him. I'm sorry about the light if you can't see it very well, but that is a good close-up of what you're looking at. It is a red knobbed coot. Now I'm not, um, you, some of you guys are wondering why it's odd that he's here. It's not odd that he's here. It's just that I haven't seen him here before. The last time I remember seeing one was in the Drakensberg. So it's not odd at all that they're here. It's just nice to see. It's just nice to see him. It is an interesting bird. I like the really white face of it. Hey. Rosalind, you'd like to know how impala protect themselves. I suppose it's also really relevant to being down here at the, at the watering hole and trying and getting a drink. Well, horns for one. They have the horns that they can use for protection. And also then they're, they're quite nimble. They can move fast. They can jump really high. I think it's about three meters high and about 12 meters across. So they can really jump and kind of skillfully move out of the way of many things and that is sort of their their best defense also what's interesting and I've been reading a bit about this recently is positioning of eyes and being a prey species or or, pre or predator you'll see you can see this with impala as well the eyes are more so situated on the sides of the head as opposed to right in front like us binocular vision and that gives them ability to have a really wide range close to a 360 degree view of where they are of what's around them sorry so that's it's about vigilance they're looking out constantly see what's around them and also they're living in a group or they're staying in a group like this and Usually if you see one antelope or other type of spray, prey species coming down to drink, uh, it's very rarely that you'll see one because that group sort of safety falls away. Whereas if, even a rabbit, if you see a rabbit or a hare, you see that that is really, really on both sides of the, of the head, the eyes. And they can see almost 360 degrees 
Sasso, you asked about a leopard, but I didn't quite get what about a leopard. Hmm? I don't know. Yeah, I didn't hear that. Sorry, Emma. Sorry, Sasso. Didn't quite hear what about a leopard. Ah, could an impala outrun a leopard? Well, I'd love to see it. But remember, the style of a leopard is not to chase down their prey, so they're it's hard to measure that sort of thing. So a leopard will not chase down their prey. They're waiting in ambush. Whereas an impala, if it sees it from a mile away, it, it won't even run, it'll bark. It, I mean, there's a whole lot of interactions happening at that time. If, a, if an impala sees a, a leopard, the leopard knows that it's been seen. The impala does its little bark, which sounds a lot like an actual dog barking. <laughs> and when the first time I heard it, I didn't actually think it wasn't it coming from an impala. And then the leopard knows it's been seen. So it's not as if you're thinking they're savage. Leopards are savage and they're just going to go after them. If they've lost their element of surprise, they're not going to do it. So that actual, the actual interaction of them running or the leopard trying to chase down the impala won't act, won't really happen, or it'll be very rare that that happens. Uh, another an example where that where that actually might happen is would say a cheetah and a Thompson's gazelle. So a, a cheetah can travel up to some people say 120 kilometers per hour. It's more likely more around 100 and 110. Some people even say more than that, but we won't really know for sure. But that's the the speed at which, it, which, at which a cheetah can move. And then you get the Thompson's gazelle, which is probably moving at the same speed. <coughs> oh, jump, jump. Yep, just be careful around there. You don't know what's there. Very cool. So there's all those interactions that you can think about. There's the eyes, the position of the eyes, whether they can see, what they can see, and of course, the horns as well very sweet anyway i am going to maybe sit here for a little longer in the meantime i'll send you over to david in the masai mara well trish don't go anywhere because i initially said i'll go somewhere but then i changed uh, my ideas shortly after because as soon as i left the lions, two girls or two females rose, looked around, and they told man, you know what, we have to go back where we are. So, but if you look at that particular one, she is on the move, and while well, there's a tumbled mound in front of her, to her right, two of them now, and I only got a feeling they could be going to look for some water, and if that would be the case, it will be exciting to see them drink water. As I said again earlier, it's a very hot day here in the Mara Triangle. And if they'll be going to drink water, there's a place that have always had like a natural well. You like the, the Chito Dam uh, in Juma in South Africa. Here is an area which have always had like a spring that never dries up. Even when you have had very dry conditions uh, in these parts of Kenya, that particular well will still hold a bit of uh, water, a bit being muddy or mucky or looking dirty and black or, you know, it should still hold some water. And I got a feeling that's where these two females would be going to drink. Now, you can see how they blend in very well in the grass. So there's that one particular female and there's another one following behind her. And I'm sure man gonna smoke her out of the grass somewhere. There she comes. Thank you, Manu. Not sure if these are, you know, two sisters in this particular pride that I'm calling the Salt Lake. And what I want to do is to get there before them and we'll just allow them to cross the road and get to this particular watering point. I'm very convinced now than before they're going to have a drink and that will be very exciting for us to see them having a drink and not sure if after the drink they'll go back to the same spot. Let me just see whether I can give Manu another low angle. And to the forward. Keep going, okay. Okay, right there. 
So one of them, the one that's leading of the two females, just stop there to have a wee break. And I'm sure as soon as she's done, she'll be on the move again. And you can see the amount of light shining on her neck, how hot, you know, the sun. Of course, that may not determine the temperature, but uh, that is a clear indication it's pretty hot at the moment. Definitely, we are not where we started. Uh, there have been quite a big drop, I would say, of temperatures now. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, you are always very welcome to send comments. Lauren, you're saying you could have seen some fire from a distance, and you're absolutely correct, Lauren. That means you're very observant. Now, you know how big the Mara is. Now, we are in what we call the Mara Triangle, because it takes the shape of a triangle. That fire is on the other side of the Mara, what we call the main Mara. And it's not unusual. This time of the year, when it's very dry, or before the long rains start, we'll always see fires everywhere. Most important, Fires in East Africa are all man-made, and we don't see any natural fires here. So I'm sure until fade down, and the game rangers are definitely are on it, making sure maybe no animals are hurt, but the animals are pretty intelligent. Once they see the fire and the smoke, they'll move to safer distances. Now, this particular lioness is still walking, and very soon, maybe in the next one minute or so, she might be crossing the road. Not sure she's a slight limp. Maybe I'm wrong. I think she's just perfect. Maybe I'm trying to remember Limpy of the Sausage Tree Pride. But there she crosses the road. And if for once anybody will ask me why this lions want to cross the road or why she crossed the road, I will have a hundred and fifteen per and fifty percent correct answer why she crossed the road. Because I'll say she crossed the road to go and drink some water now this is the other one is coming and apparently even a third one manu if you see so we got three of the five girls that we saw earlier that were under the sausage tree and i'm still hoping none of them was hit by those sausages tree coming down and maybe a fourth one from a distance and what is interesting there were five females and three males only females have walked to go have a drink and wondering, did they take so much meat earlier? And why not the males, which to me, I believe, they would be eating more meat than the females. So what we'll do now, we we'll just have to move forward a little bit, because the first one that was leading uh, the pride is just about to get the watering point. I want to take myself to a very strategic angle, not of course obstruct them as they go for a drink. You can see that is the other one. So I'm going to stop here and wait until maybe two or three of them are at the watering point. And as I wait to do that, we'll take you back to Juma to Trish. Yes, our play fight is still happening, which I think is just the cutest thing ever. them go it's amazing how you can actually see baby but they're going down and coming up again I was saying it's so it really is amazing how you'll have something that's a baby version I mean like a, a lion cub or here a hippo calf and they really do look like like a baby they really have baby features, even though they're these ferocious creatures, you may think, as they grow. Oh, and they're down again. These two have been playing up and down. Are you going to come back up first? Ah, there you go. Ah. Maybe they're really hot too. They've decided, no, stay underwater. Tiny things. Well, not so tiny, I suppose. But very, very cute. Now, little hippos. Obviously, they need to play. They need to learn and grow. But also, you'll see them together like this. So they don't necessarily have to be siblings or anything like that. But they will sort of stay in a nursery group. 
which is the cutest thing because it means lots of babies in one spot. Oh, can you hear? Very cute. Cheryl, you'd like to know if hippos have twins. I'm quite sure that they do not. I think twins would be really, really difficult to carry as a hippo mum. I think it would be already hippo calves weigh something like 40 kgs at birth, possibly even much more. You know, when you read our books, there's so many inconsistencies about who says what and what weighs how much. but I am sure that they would not be able to carry twins. Twins are, yeah, twins are difficult. <laughs> anyway, their play has stopped now. And I think I'm going to move off. Oh, there's a few little ones down here, Seb, if you can see them. But they seem to be a bit far. Excuse our aerial there. Oh, that's a little one. Why aren't you with the rest of the group? This one looks tinier than the other two we saw playing there. Now, mums will often do this. Hippo mums will do this. If their calves are much smaller than the other calves in their group or their bloat, as their collective is, then they will often actually keep their calves in a certain uh, sort of away from the others because they don't want them to get hurt and they want them to have enough sort of support from mum. And they'll probably do this for about 10 days or so after birth, but it can go for longer if they've decided that it's too dangerous to join the rest of the group. So I think that's what mum there is doing at the moment. Uh, either that or she's disciplining little one. But I think that's way too small to be disciplined. What, what could it be doing wrong? It's the cutest thing. All right, let us head out of Chitwa and see what else we can find. Emma says hippos look like they cause nonsense. I, I have to agree, they do look very cute. Bye Chitwa. All right, let me send you over to Tristan while I get out of here. And I'll see what else I can find and I think he's got at least an update for you. Well, at least you had something, Trish. It's been very, very, very quiet on our side of the reserve. We haven't seen very much at all. Just a lot of elephant tracks and elephant poo and elephant dung. Uh, well, I suppose that's elephant poo and dung is the same thing, isn't it? I meant urine one of those afternoons where things are getting mixed up and words are not coming out but it's okay we'll eventually get them out the way we want them to um, but we are heading towards uh, Gari Dam at the moment Emma is giving me trouble now she's being ugly to me everybody just can't do anything around here without the FC jumping on your back about it just kidding um, so we did hear some Ellie's across from us on the other side and we saw lots of tracks and things so we're going to just see if they're coming towards Gari Dam. I'm not being sassy Emma, I'm just just joking around, just kidding as they say, as a kid would say. Right so we're hoping that there's going to be Ellie's coming towards the dam, that's what I'm hoping for. I hope they haven't already been. Somebody's probably going to pop my little balloon and my idea by telling me that the Ellie's were already at the dam five minutes ago. But Let's go double check and see. I certainly don't see them. Oh, There's the world's impala population at the dam, that's for sure. Craig, I don't know why I keep punishing us. And, oh, sorry, Craig, sorry. It's very rocky down there. Oh, right. I don't know why I keep punishing us and putting us on dam walls without shade. Although this one's got the jackalberry, so we should be able to mm, maybe find some sort of shade. Yes, poor Craig. Woe is me. 
It's a bumpy road. I'm so sorry, Craig. Right, let's stop here, Craig, where it's at least a little bit of shade. Look, Craig, I'll leave you in the shade and put me in the sun. Uh, it's, no, it's no worries, Craig. Anything for you and your comfort. Um, so there we go. You can see, like I say, that the world's impala population is coming down to drink at Gari Dam. It's this time of the day now, in the next sort of, I'd say, 45 minutes, that we're going to start to see a lot of movement of animals uh, coming for water. It's starting just to slowly cool just a little bit now. Um, that real kind of heat is starting to dissipate a bit. Um, and that's when you'll find that the animals will start to make their way down for water. And this particular grouping that we're seeing here, this is going to be the herd that will probably in all likelihood end up on quarantine this evening. Um, it is a big herd that often spends time on quarantine and I'm pretty sure it's the same ones because I can see some wildebeest coming down and generally the wildebeest tag along with the impalas and then all of them come for a drink. They quench their thirst and they start to make their way up onto quarantine just around sunset so that they can stay in the nice open clearings and not get themselves too close to potential predators and in areas where they can at least see what's going on. But there you can see the wildebeest slowly kind of coming down. It's not quite the Mara migration, but it's nice to see some wildebeest slowly coming down towards some water. And hopefully they'll all line up and have a nice little drink at the pan. I can't say I blame them. It is really very warm still, considering it's now sort of 4.30. You would expect it, or local time, you would expect it to have been cooled down by now. Now, Elko, yes, they also need moving in a line. I find antelope are, are pretty good with that kind of thing, is they generally do come down in single file towards water, and they generally do it in quite an orderly fashion. Um, it's not normally chaotic in any way. It's not like wild dogs that just run in from all directions. Um, these guys generally, you'll find, come in a nice kind of neat little line, and then everybody sort of lines up along the bank and finds their little spot, and then they begin to drink. You can see the impalas all kind of looking for a little place to drink and they are still wary even though there hasn't been a crocodile that we know of in this water um, for many 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 months these guys are still fairly kind of nervous you'll see they'll drink for a little bit and they'll reverse backwards and then come forward again now Vicky you say party time at Gari Dam seems like it now we just need little Clalumba to come to the party apparently she wasn't too far from here this morning and um, she was headed kind of northeast away from this pan but hopefully she'll arrive and that certainly will put the proverbial cat amongst the pigeons in this particular party but it would be nice if she did make a welcome addition to the guest list i'm not sure the impalas and the wildebeest would agree with me but well what can we say we're biased towards having little Clalumba around I know. Thanks, Emma. Very punny, wasn't it? <laughs> Emma's giving me lots of trouble today. I don't think Emma's finding me too funny today at all. Anyway, it's okay. I'll survive, I think. As she once told me that she said, because Emma's got red hair, she said to me that gingers have no soul. And that's why she was being, so, maybe that's why she's being so nasty to me. <laughs> Anyway, maybe not. She's probably going to kill me at some point uh, in my sleep. Uh, she, when next time she visits Juma, I'm going to. If you don't see me the next morning on drive, you'll know something's gone wrong. But anyway, we're <laughs> going to spend some time watching these guys have a bit of a drink, um, and then kind of probably have a bit of a drink of our own, um, and see. <laughs> and so while we kind of sit here, Emma's saying that the entire Facebook world is going to be out to get her. Don't worry, Emma, there's going to be a whole bunch that are going to defend you for knowing that I'm full of nonsense as it is. In the meantime, though, let's pop you off to David in the Mara um, and see how his lions are doing. Well, you're very right, Tristan. I'm following a very special predator here. I'm calling her special because it's lioness like any other lioness as you've seen before. But she's on a very fast move. And definitely, she's not going for a hunt. I got a feeling she's going to get her cub somewhere. She stopped at one point on a Tamil mound. And looking carefully at her, I saw some sacomax, which means she is nursing or she's breastfeeding. And definitely, she must have left the cubs earlier in the morning somewhere. I think it's time for her to go catch up with them. Now, look at that. See the height of the grass? She definitely tends to disappear in that uh, red oat grass, which is getting taller and higher with a minute. And so what I want to do, because I do not want to lose her, is very slowly to drive in this particular direction and find out 
where she is going to lead us. Well, I've been seeing so many cubs here lately. Uh, you all know the all little pride of lions. The two females there are the good cubs. You all know my favorite pride of lions, the sausage tree pride. Poof, so many cubs in that particular pride. Now, it will be exciting for me if I'm going to see other prides or other cubs rather with this particular lioness and with my other friend Pat, you saw the Owinos also have cubs. And I think the last they had, there were three as much as Pat. Lastly, so only one. I think gonna be a bumper harvest of cubs here uh, this particular time. And I'm sure there could be a question there that I might have missed. And I'm sure M will bring it again. So I have to be careful here because of the rocks. Exactly more. We got loads of cubs here at the moment. And what that can translate into, if they're going to make it through to the migration, I'm talking about June, July, it will be a wonderful time for them to see maturity because one of the causes or one of the big causes of mortality for lion cubs is uh, hunger but if they're going to make it through when this is the green period when it's very tight and it's very dry in terms of availability of resources when the will come then it'll be a wonderful time for them to make it through just have to maneuver here very slowly and surely to make sure I don't get into a rock because the grass is quite high and also I don't want to lose this particular lioness. This is one of the drawbacks of the tall grass, but I would say so far, so good. So we need to have both my eyes and Manu's eye out. Manu should like concentrate on the lioness because he's much taller than me. He's standing up, which makes my life easier. So when I'm just putting my eyes on the ground, okay, there she is. She's still moving. Manu, can you see her? Still the best thing is to get a little closer to her. But I can say definitely she's going to get her cubs somewhere. Either she needs to go and suckle them or just maybe bring them back. Or bring them back to the main pride. So let me keep maneuvering here slowly, slowly and catch up with her. And I'll take you back to the gentleman by the waterhole, Tristan. Good luck, David. That grass gets hectic in the Mara and it's hard to negotiate what's going on, but maybe you'll be rewarded with little ones. If she's got suckle marks, maybe that's where she's off to to go and find the little cubs. But in the meantime, we're sitting watching a very playful little baby wildebeest, much like the warthogs. It's having the best time in the mud at the moment. You can see it's rolling around and it must be so nice when it's hot and you kind of got this thick, well, I suppose not thick, but I mean, this hairy body. It must be so nice to come down and have a little roll around and cool off in that water and mud and level to be still not ones that are really that well known for kind of covering their whole bodies you'll often find the males will kind of shove their foreheads into into mud and they'll cake their face and their horns in it but you don't often see them actually rolling around too much in it but that little one obviously was just so hot it couldn't resist having a good mud bath and just trying to cool its body down as much as possible it's pretty hard life for a little baby to be born right in the sort of hot part of the sort of year and then has to deal with the heat for sort of six months of its of its beginning of its life to then it gets into the cooler temperatures where i'm sure it's a lot more comfortable um, than it is in the summer months but really nice to have just been sitting here and watch this you know we often kind of amble past our wildebeest and our impalas and we don't really spend too much time so it's been very pleasant just to sit here with them for a little bit and just enjoy their kind of company and the noises that they make the little baby impalas have been squeaking a bit as as have the various little wildebeest now craig you see there's a little water monitor that's cruising around at the bottom here it looks like it's investigating some elephant poo down right in the bottom left corner of the dam you see there's an elephant poo right closest to us in the corner and there's the monitors just kind of moving around on the poo itself at this stage it looks like it's almost trying to clamber up on top of it it's not going to go well because that's going to be moving around i'm afraid 
Should be quite entertaining. Let's see if it keeps trying to go up and over. No, it's decided just to cling on. Well, I suppose this is a natural pool noodle, really. So, um, dung floats generally, and this monitor lizard might be thinking to itself, well, I don't feel like holding up my body, so I'm just going to grab onto the dung and use it like a pool noodle and float around the dam and just kind of have a bit of fun. Exactly. An elephant lilo smells a little bit, but certainly gets the job done if you're a monitor lizard. You see it's got its head up on there now, and it's basically taking it very easy and can kind of float around the dam like this now. Titanic flashbacks. I don't think it's quite as dramatic as that, and I don't think many people on the Titanic would have wanted to use a elephant blue lilo in the middle of a freezing ocean, but um, this... This monitor lizard, I suppose, has certainly made use of it. And I, I, it's not really as important as a lifeboat because the edge of the water is about not even one kind of body length away from where this guy is. You can see there it is there. But um, I suppose when you're feeling lazy and you don't feel like holding your own body up and swimming or sitting out in the hot sun, sitting on with your head on a piece of elephant poo certainly does the job. Quite clever if you think about it though. I wonder how many times it's done this before. Certainly the first time I've ever seen a monitor lizard rest its head on elephant poo floating in a water point. I have, can say I have honestly never seen that before, which is quite crazy. I suppose they use rocks and logs and things, but maybe it's not as comfortable as it looks. So a lot of you said you didn't know that, well, you didn't realize elephant dung was as buoyant as it is. It is very buoyant stuff. There's actually quite a few floating around along the edges and even towards the middle here, there's two big kind of balls that are floating along. Um, and so it's it's very, very buoyant. So you find that it's, it often kind of sits on the top of the, the water and when a big herd has been around. What are you doing, monitor lizard? Wait, hmm, what is going on? I have no idea what this monitor is doing. It's kind of going back and forth. It seems like it's quite confused with life. Hmm, let's see where it ends up from here. Which way are you going to go and why are you swimming around in circles? It doesn't look like it's hunting, so it doesn't look like it's looking for any sort of food items. It's kind of haphazardly swimming around. Um, I don't know, maybe there's bits of grass or things that are getting tangled on its feet or its tail. That's why it's having a bit of a struggle to actually move around, but it doesn't look like it's really wanting to go anywhere in any sort of haste at all. And this is kind of bobbing along. Well, there we go. Now we've picked up a little bit of speed, but still not really going anywhere too fast. And like I say, it doesn't look like it's hunting anything. It's not as though it's rooting around doing anything of note. Strange. Most is having a little frolic in the shallow end. Maybe it's just doing it because it wants to. Now, Wildebeest in the background has decided to do what I was talking about. Oh, now it's going to stop, of course. But it was doing what I was talking about earlier at one point it has had its head in the mud and I was saying that they often shove their faces into it but it has of course now stopped because I asked Craig to go there and you know they were wandering off anyway while we kind of ponder as to what our monitor lizard has been up to and why it's been swimming around in circles let's send you across to Trish who's got a animal that is doing none of that and is just lying in the shade pondering the heat My hyena truly is lazy. Look at her. Oh, well done. You picked your head up, girl. Is this his ribbon? Of course, part of our Juma clan, and I am at the Juma den. Hoping maybe the cubs would be out. Maybe a ribbon is here. Her cubs would come out. I still want to see them. Haven't seen them. They were moved here when I was on leave, so I'm desperately wanting to see them. But she just looks like... Not today. Definitely not today. Hmm. Look at that. They are beautiful creatures. Absolutely beautiful. They always get a bad rap, but... Well, I suppose we all kind of think of them as these... conniving creatures. 
happy. Guys, I'm glad to have me back at the Hyena Den. I am ecstatic to be back at the Hyena Den. Always love it. Love all my girls here. I wonder if they if they know me. I know they won't know me like, ah, oh, hi, Shala, as I'm driving by, but I wonder if they know my smell or my look. Shizeb, you say such a lazy girl. Is there any other word to describe her? Yes, we're talking about you. Yes, stripping girl. You're being lazy. Can you please bring out your cubs for us? I think that's a no, guys. <laughs> See, Kentra, oh, you want to know how Ribbon got her name? Well, it's actually quite interesting. She's actually got, if you look at her spot pattern, and that's usually what we do, we look at their spots and see if we can kind of, you know how your brain will form images and things from spots that are close together. So Ribbon actually has a ribbon-shaped kind of spots on her left side well at least that's how she got her name now i don't always see it very clearly but i always think that she's got lines of spots in fact you can see it there on her flanks on the sides of her you see she's got lines like kind of two lines coming down kind of like a racetrack almost i always think as those of those as ribbons but i know her mostly or immediately the first thing i see is her ear and that's how I know it's ribbon immediately. She's kind of got that B, B shape plus the nick at the top. Oh, little ribbon. Hmm. You'll see hyenas often have nicks all over their ears rips tears nicks however you want to call them they often have them all over their ears and of course that makes it easier for us to id but it's also because like i've said before this kind of social organization that they have at the moment um well that they always have hyenas have is openly competitive so there's always bits of fighting going on low ranking individuals can try their luck So there's always bits of biting and fighting happening. It's very, very rare to see ones with whole, whole ears. Joy, Joy in Hong Kong, how lovely to have, a, have you with us. Yes, I do agree with you. She does have a butterfly ear. I think it's very cute. See, she's, she's hiding it away now because she's shy. Ribbon, show us your butterfly ear, please. Are you listening to something there? She says, no, I'm shy of joy in Hong Kong. I'm shy. Now, Emma has just put an idea in my head and I think I like it. She says, it would be hilarious if hyenas had earrings. I think it would be great. I've always thought that, um, I'm sure you guys are familiar, at least some of you with Daryl, the elephant, that often comes around camp, big bull, and he's got a hole in his ear. I always thought you could put a bangle through there or something. He'd look so cool. He'd be the envy of all the other elephants. You would too, Ribbon, if you had one. You can look at her nose, you can see that she's breathing quite... Well, it's not, it's not exactly panting, but there's it's deep breaths. You can see the nostrils flaring. Open and close, open and close. Now you see it with a lot of animals 
that the nose stays quite moist. Then you see it with dogs, I'm sure you know, with your dogs at home. And that is actually, that moisture keeps them cool. Because then the blood goes through the nose area, gets cooled down by the evaporative cooling from their nose, and then they can stay nice and cool. So let's see if Ribbon wakes up. If she doesn't, I'll have to move on, maybe come back a little later. In the meantime, let's go back over to Tristan. Oh! Oh, of course you had to stay with me. Did you see that? I'm sure you guys were had the same reaction Seb and I had. Just as we wanted to cross over to Tristan, this little head popped up and both of us said, oh, oh. And we knew we had to stay here. Oh, hello, Poppet. You just had a bit of a yawn when you were napping inside there. It must be hot in there. Very cute. Oh, someone else coming out. Someone else is coming out. It's your friend coming out. <laughs> I'm gonna play hide and seek with you. Now. <laughs> come up, come up again. No. Very sweet. Now, these two, probably Junes, like I said, I haven't seen ribbons yet. And when I was speaking to Jamie about ribbons, she said that they're really tiny still and little balls of black fluff. So these ones you can see are slightly spotty. So these are Junes. Now, we know that we also have Plonk, Corky's, Corky's young man here as well. And of course, Pretties too that often mooch about you as well. Come little one, do you need some encouragement? It absolutely is precious Linda, I couldn't agree with you more. Those little heads, when they pop out of that den, those little heads are just too precious. Linda's sending you some love. Yes, she thinks you're precious. I think he likes your comment Linda. <laughs> Are you still playing hide and seek with us? Let's see what this other one is investigating on the side there. Kind of had his nose up to the window, wonder if he smelt something. I actually don't know if this is a boy or a girl. Like we've said to you before many times, it's really hard to tell with hyena because of their really odd genitals then. Both sexes have a scrotum and of course a penis, a pseudo penis, so it is really difficult even at this point. Now if this other little one will come out, I think that would be really great to share with a bigger audience. Come encourage your friend to come out. Very cute. Oh, can you hear the birds? Can you hear the birds? Janet, what your what a uh, actual really nice observation. You say that you think the first one that came out is the dominant one. I think that's a good observation. 
came out first. It was a bit more confident. The other one was kind of a little bit more afraid, still in the, still in the actual den. Well, your guess is as good as mine at this point, but it's always nice to watch cubs interact because then you can get a really good idea of who's dominant over who. But if you remember, if you remember when Pretty's cubs were born and one was really small and one was really big and we thought that it was because, oh, biting flies, stop biting me. And we thought, of course, it was because the one obviously was dominant over the other one. And when we talk about dominance, it's not simply I will kill you or attack you while you're in the den. It's also about I'm going to deprive you. I'm going to deprive you of food. I'm going to deprive you of the spaces that I want to sit on. And all those things can affect the health of the hyena, of the little cub. And when we saw that, we were we thought that the bigger one was dominant over the little one because of that type of deprivation. But it turns out, and Jamie was actually speaking to us about it as well. Jamie is the expert when it comes to these guys. We were actually saying that the smaller one seems to be the female. So that's interesting. So it may have just been that the smaller one got sick or something like that. And remember we saw them kind of fight for the same position when suckling. And when when cubs have sorted out who's dominant and who's going to be subordinate, they know exactly where to go and suckle in the positions that they need to take. And they were fighting over the same position to suckle um, when Pretty had those cubs. So it's always really interesting to see them interact and actually you can clearly see. So not a bad guess there to say that one is out and confident, but see, gone straight back in. Now we've just got ribbon chilling. Grace, you'd like to know if male hyenas often come to the den? Um, often, when we say often, I may have seen them for every time I've come to the den. I must have seen them here, uh, I'd say about 30 to 40% of the time but they tend to sort of stay on the periphery. I haven't ever seen a male come up to the actual entrance of the den. It, that may happen, but I haven't seen it. But I do often see them on the periphery, kind of around the den. And what the females will do is they'll sort of employ them to be babysitters of sorts. And they'll hang around and take care in terms of watching the cubs. And that is a really integral integral part of being a male hyena because those male hyenas that are of course those are not part of this uh or rather they were not born into this clan so they are trying to get uh, sort of accepted into it and it's not just about acceptance it's also about mating rights so if they hang around and they be really nice to the to the females and this can take months then maybe the female will mate with them. So they do tend to hang out a little bit around the den, of course, but I most often see males kind of alone and um, near kills. <laughs> That's where I most often see them. But like I said, it's a, b a big part of their life to be able to to be able to integrate themselves into this, into a clan where they can breed. Joy from Hong Kong. That is a really interesting question as well. Does the order in which they are born, I suppose the order in which they come out of the canal, affect the dominance? From what I, from what I know, well, actually, I don't know. Let's just say that first. But if I had to think about it, I don't think so. But there are certain things that do affect the dominance um, sort of in vitro, which is really interesting because... Hyenas have a really similar placenta structure as humans do. And um, I thought it, I think it's called hem, hem something like that. 
big scientific word that I can't really, really uh, remember at this point. But what it means is that the blood barrier between the placenta or rather between the mother and the blood vessels of the of the baby, there's not many barriers between. So there's a good transport of nutrients and blood between them and, of course, hormones. So the young get an influx of the the sexual hormones, the androgen, all of that, and they get a really big boost of it while they're still in the womb. And the amount of boost they get depends on whether the mum is high-ranking or not. So, for example... We know that the, the pseudo scrotum and the pseudo penis that the females get are also a result of that boost of testosterone androgen that comes in, and that's why they get that. But the amount that they get can also be based on whether the mum is high ranking or not. And that's really interesting because that relates to this is very scientific now, but it relates to the size of the telomeres, which are the little kind of caps at the end of the chromosomes. and. It appears that subordinate or lower ranking individuals have lower caps on those telomeres and whereas high ranking individuals have higher caps and what that means is that higher caps indicate better health less stress and longer long well yeah higher longevity so they live longer so when these hyenas have a whole lot of stress going on and they are subordinate they are kind of shortening the telomeres and that same sort of shortening affects the amount of sex hormones that get put into or get transferred to their young so it's really really interesting really delicate and very molecular at this point but it's nice to see how those things that we kind of just observe actually have an explanation they actually have down to a molecular explanation of why this is happening which i think is i think it's very cool it also speaks to the complexity of these creatures yeah i must agree with you all it is very interesting it is a bit a bit difficult to read all of that my head hurt just a little bit but they are very clever very intelligent rosemary do you say you like science or you're asking if i like science doesn't matter we all like science science for you science for me science for everybody i do i love science i hope you guys do too it's always nice to get down to the nitty-gritty <laughs> We all, we all get some science. There's even some science for you there in FC. Science for everybody. But I like it. I like it because it. sometimes the, just the explanation is not sufficient for me. And I want to know, but why? How does it happen? Where does it happen? Very cool. Some other things I was reading about losing atoms, adding atoms. But I have to read that a hundred more times before I can explain it to you. In the meantime, it seems that our cubs have snuck back away into their hiding place. I thought it would be hot in there, but obviously it's nice and cool. In the meantime, let me send you back over to Tristan. Well, we're still bumbling about, just trying to see what's around. Uh, we checked kind of the roads around where Clalambo was seen, she hasn't come out of the block yet um, by the looks of things, but it's still so warm that that block and the grass is so thick and so um, dense that the chances of finding her is going to take quite a long time on foot to find her. You know, we're not going to be able to just kind of spot her from the road, I don't think, unless she's up on a mound or a tree, the chances are almost zero. So what we're doing as I thought I'd come to Buffalzook Dam for a little bit, just see if there's any Ellies that maybe are coming down for an afternoon drink. Um, and if there's nothing here, then we're gonna slowly meander our way back into that area. And then we'll just start to check all the little water points around there that I can think of in the hope that we bump into her at one of those, because she's got to go for water at some point. It's been such a warm day that I would expect as soon as that sun starts to get low enough, that she'll be up and moving. 
Lauren, why have we had so many elephant sightings recently? Um, I don't know. I certainly, I, to be honest with you, I haven't had any. <laughs> so, um, everybody else seems to be seeing elephants but me, which is quite strange. But anyway, um, no idea, really. It, it could just be a, a situation where there's a lot of growth that's taken place um, in the last few months. Um, and that's led to, you know, a lot of good food available. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting one because so we certainly haven't had the sort of rainfall that some of the other camps have had. Um, and we certainly haven't really kind of um, got any fruiting plants at the moment, which means that I'm not really sure why we've had an influx of alies of late. Um, I suppose there's really good grass growth at the moment that's all seeding. And so that's pretty good for, the, for them. But that should be the case pretty much all over um, the Kruger Park system. Um, so I don't know. Maybe maybe we maybe we just have something that I haven't noticed that they're feeding on, but it would certainly be nice to see that there's been a lot of Ellie's around of late. Um, you know, it's always nice when we get lots of Ellie's and big herds in particular is always very, very pleasant. And as you can see, Scuba Steve, and I don't know if Snorkel Sarah's here, we were ch chatting earlier about um, Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah. Well, I wasn't, but Trishala was. And I'm pretty sure that the reason they're here is probably because he wasn't a strong enough bull to challenge at Chitwa Dam and was chased out of that area, potentially, if he did come from there or from another water source and found this with nobody home. And so this is the perfect place to settle if you're a younger bull that's not strong enough to challenge all the big old bulls, then, well, why not come into an area like this um, and spend some time here and then if there's a female around well she's just kind of incorporated her into his grouping and they've then sort of established this as their water point now of course if it really rains and it starts to kind of fill up properly which it hasn't done by any stretch of the imagination this dam is still incredibly shallow and and low for what it should be at this time of the year then this would be a really great place for hippos to be. Um, they would have a perfect, perfect habitat here. And in fact, if this was full up and the way it can be, then you'd find that this would easily be able to house probably, you know, 10, 15 hippos, no problem. Um, at the moment, though, it, it's fluctuating so much with the seasons that it's really not the most ideal habitat for hippos to spend time. And it's probably why you're finding the females are not actually coming here all that much, is that it's not really the greatest place in the winter. They've got to move out. Remember that this dried up in this last winter, which would have meant that Steve and Snorkel Sarah would have had to have gone and found somewhere else to go and rest and to stay out of the sun and, and hydrate and all those kind of factors that we often talk about. So, you know, I, I think that's probably the reason why these are two younger individuals um, that have tried to find somewhere else and, and distributed away and probably been pushed out by others. And that's why they've ended up here. Um, I, I, like I say, I don't think it's the best habitat for for them in that it keeps drying up. I think if this dam really fills up, then they're going to be in the pound seats because they're going to have the most beautiful spot for hippos and they're going to have it all to themselves. But of course, as things get wetter and these things get deeper, so eventually other young bulls wander about or females and they find it and then they are very much going to take over and kind of utilize this as their own sort of area interesting that they're not even close together today they're kind of facing away from one another it's probably due to the fact that there was a vehicle here when we arrived um, that's why they're kind of facing in two different directions and kind of just looking out for one another in terms of what potential threats that there could be us on this side and then the other vehicle was on the other side and so kind of just keep looking around and just making sure what's happening Zephyr, you think so? Well, we'll certainly see about that. At some point, Scuba Steve is going to have to fight for his little water hole. And um, he, you never know, he might get a bit of a hiding if a really big bull comes along. But he might also, you know, develop. And because nobody's kind of come in the last year or two, he's grown and gotten bigger. And 
maybe he will be able to defend it and keep it as his own. But it's going to be interesting to see how it goes because if we don't get any more rainfall, let's say hypothetically no more rain um, for the rest of the summer for us and, and we kind of get nothing before winter, this is going to dry up again. It's not going to be full. You can actually even see on the edges of Bifelsuk Dam already that little island is starting to form midway through the dam. Now this island kind of cuts off the dam into two sections. I mean, it gives you an idea of, even though it looks like a beautiful expanse of water at the moment, incredibly shallow. And so that kind of mud there is starting to show now, and eventually this becomes an island, and then the water all starts to dissipate. So there really isn't a lot of water in here, and if we don't get any more rain, or any decent rain, should I say, then in all likelihood, um, Scuba Steve is going to be having to look for a new home, and not, life is not going to be that simple. Um, it's tricky for hippos to find new homes. They've got to travel long distances over rugged terrain and obviously you've got to compete with a lot of other individuals when they do so. All right, well, we're going to leave the two of them. There's no sign of any um, anything else happening at Bifosuk Dam. And so while we carry on and go and see what else we can find, let's send you across to David, who's driving off into the sunset, I believe. Well, a, a dam or a waterhole like Bifosuk every time I remember I was in Juma, it had water, I would say, all the time I stayed there. And we do not have a lot of areas or water points uh, in the Mara that are that huge, that could hold as much water as we've seen in Bufushok or in uh, Chitwa, Chitwa. Now, I left my lions because what they did, they went in a very difficult area for me to follow them. And I thought it was not worth trying to break the car and I thought, you know, you keep going, I'm going to follow you another time. And here I am on a big road and I'm sure I'll be seeing something different. I'm trying to think because I have a lot of time, I might even chance and go to the Associated Republic and find out what could be happening there. Since I got back from home, this is my third day or my third drive and I have not seen uh, the sausages, and not even any of my colleagues. I'm talking about uh, Pat or Lauren, they haven't seen them. And I think the last person who saw them could have been Lauren, I guess. Maybe that was about uh, one week ago. So they, both of them know I love these particular cuts. And they're like, all right, David, you're back. Take over your cuts. And also somehow, me and Manu, tend to like the same uh, pride of lions. So we have agreed we'll work very hard for the next few days and get them. All right, not sure I missed something there. M, just getting a little bit windy. And very funny, the left side of the grass, or of the road have very high grass, and the right side, the grass is quite short. Yes, you are all very correct that the sausage tree pride are my favorite. And I'll say for one obvious reason, I mean, the area they are is one area they have always protected. And they're protected against other lions. They're protected against other species like hyenas or leopards once in a while. But above all, they got nine cubs of different ages. And there's nothing as good as that. It's like going to a school and seeing kids of kindergartens, kids of the primary level, and kids of a secondary school, or rather high school, all coming together to play. So as parents, or as we, as watchers, it gives us a lot of joy just to watch kids of different ages just, you know, playing around. And when you see their mothers watching, all the five females in that particular pride, when you see them watching, it's always very interesting. I'm not sure there's anything on top of that rock there. And of course, there is either some, uh, is the African jacana man, it is that bad there, that's got a white head, very good. And we call that bad the African jacana. They've got very huge feet and they can basically just walk, not on water, but they can walk on the leaves or the lilies that float on water. It's beautiful bad. We see the polyandras. You'll get one male with a couple of females. And the plant in front of it there is very similar to what we call the water hyacinth. Water hyacinth, which has been a bit of a concern 
in such a freshwater lakes in Africa, including the largest lake we got here called Lake Victoria. She's definitely hungry, busy feeding on some, some little, I would guess, any invertebrates right there. See the bluish greyish front head or forehead that she got. And the beauty about them is what I was saying, they can comfortably see how she's walking on that leaf. And they'll not be able to see. Oops, that was a very quick uh, number two. How much you wondering how high jacanas can fly? I'll tell you something interesting. I do not remember Romet. The last time or the first time I saw jacanas in the air. You'll be surprised. I've been in the African wilderness or bushes for so very many years, but I cannot remember the last time or the first time I saw these birds in air. Now, Mon, if you go to the left of that jacana, to the very edge of the water, there are two rocks there, and I'm not sure there. Very good. That's what initially I first saw before I saw the jacana, and I get, I guess rather, that's what you call the marsh terrapin. Very good man for spotting them. This is the marsh terrapin, and definitely sunning themselves before the sun goes down. It's appealing for me to see terrapins that I've not seen for quite some time, and I'm sure they're going to make up for my lost lions. And one big difference between the terrapins and the tattoos, you'll always get the terrapins in general, these ones, uh, in fresh water uh, bodies. And I agree with you, Em. You see they blend in, in the water very well. We initially got here, I saw them, then they disappeared. Because if they put their necks down and their head down, I mean, their bodies or what you'll call uh, the, is it the carapace, uh, the, the, the shell, it just looks exactly like that rock. African jacana is still feeding. See something interesting there. We've got some swallows that are just diving the water and catching themselves some food. Wow, look at that. In, grab something and fly. Swallows and swift have uh, that ability to catch their food in flight. They rarely perch. They are always moving. Yes, I might agree with you. That's pretty awesome. Just to see how they're feeding. And they'll catch whatever it is. If they need to crush it, crush it very quickly and straight to the tummies. We've got particular types of sifts that spend most of the time in the air. Very good job, Manu, to be able to catch up with them as they keep flying. This area must have been dug, must have been, you know, an area that was dug for Maram way back. And then either they reached some, or the water table was quite high, and water just popped up, and Manu, don't tell me that is a hippopotamus. I'm sure that could be a rock. I'd be surprised if it is, or is it another terrapin? Looks like it. Well done. Yeah, that is another marsh terrapin having a little swim there. Yeah, very good, man. Yeah, that's sporting. I saw the back initially, and I thought it could have been a rock or something in there. But yeah, you're right, and that's the face of a marsh terrapin. Wondering how long they would stay underwater without breathing. Rado, right, you're saying very good camera work, and of course, all the credits go to Manu. Manu, very good. He got very good eyes, Manu. He loves spot things sometimes I do not see. And not sure that is some sort of sandpiper. Yeah, I would guess, yeah, that's some sort of sandpiper. And you see the tent remain on the edge of the water and they will come in the water like the African jacana that we saw before because they'll definitely sink. They don't have as big feet or as large feet like the jacana. Excellent. I think we just need to move, leave the sun pipers there. I don't know where the, uh, the African jacana went. Could have been still feeding somewhere. The marsh terrapins, same rock sunning themselves and my guess is that could be a male and a female and could be a nice pair and as soon as of course the sun goes down they'll be back in the water where they definitely will be feeling uh, much safer i'm sure trish decided to leave the hyenas and should be happy to tell us what her plans are Uh, 
I'm also waiting for the sun to go down just a little bit. But I must say it's cooled just the slightest. It definitely is a softer kind of sun and heat now. Yes, and we said it's all about water holes today because that's how hot it is. And I am on the part of the reserve that has very few water holes at the moment. So I've decided to leave Ribbon and June's Cub at the moment because June's cub kind of snuck back in out again just a little bit and I want to return there in not too long. We have the kids joining us a little bit later so I'd like to show them the cubs. So I'm going to return this. So don't despair I will be back there. I should probably tell myself that. That's what I'm telling myself. Don't despair Trishala. You're going to go back there just now. <laughs> I do love it. So now we are just on the kind of extreme west of the reserve. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to find some elephants. I've had such good luck with elephants the last few days that I'm hoping they'll be around. I did check Twin Dams and that is the dam that's probably, that's the dam closest to the hyena den. But no luck at all. Like none. There were not even birds hanging about there. There were a few starlings in a tree and that was about it. And of course doves. You have to have the doves. Oh, at least there's some nice shade here. Wonderful shade. Yes, there's always doves. I remember when I asked, when we checked Galago Pan once and I said, what do we think is going to be there? Curse popped up and she's like, doves! Yes, because there's almost definitely going to be a dove. Well, I didn't get to speak to you yesterday, but yesterday was, in fact, the, well, what was the date yesterday? 19th? Was it the 19th, Seth? Was it? Today is the 21st, is it? No, today is the 20th. Oh, no, it's, it's 5.21, so I read the 20th. <laughs> <laughs> oh, while we get our <laughs> dates in order. So yesterday was the 19th. <laughs> so yesterday was the 19th and on the 19th of March and last year, yeah, 2018, get my year right at least was the anniversary of the death of the last northern white rhino. His name was Sudan. So I did want to speak to you about him. I'd like to tell you a little bit about something in history for that day. Today there was not too much. Oh, except for International Frog Day. Let's not forget. And let's not ever let Tristan forget that he's got to do a frog noise for us. He's got to croak. Yes, he does. But um, that's a nice one for today, and I think there was something about a radar, but not too much biological importance. But I did want to bring to the, your attention to, oh, roadblock. <laughs> if I tried to move this, like I said to Seb, there was another one. I'll just have to let Juma know. There was another one just like this, and I said to Seb, oh, let me hop out, let me move it. He looked at me and he said, mm -mm, you're not moving anything. <laughs> Yes, but back to the rhino. So Sudan was euthanized on the 19th of March after he had a number of infections and he was the last northern white rhino. He had, is survived by two, I think, two females, his daughter and granddaughter. And they are trying to, I think they've still kept a bit of his semen. So they're trying to kind of see if they can inseminate one of the other females, uh, maybe even of the the other, the southern white rhinos, and see what can happen. Now there's a, there's, some people think there's a distinction, some people say there's no distinction, but f like for the ICUN list, IUCN <laughs> list, <laughs> they, there's no distinction between the southern white rhino and the northern white rhino. They are the same species as far as they're concerned. but genetically apparently they are totally distinct species so it's just something to highlight the decline of 
lots of mammals in the world. I saw something today that said 50% of mammals are in decline, mammal populations. Janet, you say it's really interesting that the females are still alive. It really is, but also remember those females are his offspring, so it's his daughter and granddaughter, so he is probably a lot older than him than they are. I don't know actually the exact ages, but they are probably much older than he is. But it is it is really interesting. It's kind of you feel so disconnected from it sometimes because it's happening in this part of the world that you may not be in. It happens all the time for everybody. You're so focused on what's happening around you that you forget something, the last of something went away, the last of something died. And that always strikes me. I feel there's very few, at least from the time that I've been alive, very few things that were the last of. It is, it is absolutely severe. 50% of mammal populations are in decline. Just something to keep in mind and something of course to appreciate the fact that we get to see these mammals all the time. We get to see whole lots of things, elephants, lions, all those big cats, beautiful things that we get to experience every day and that we get to bring to you. Yet they are in decline. But the more we do this and the more you interact and you get to know them and you learn about them, the more appreciation and awareness goes around. And that is always, always key. Sorry, I made it a little bit solemn, but I thought it would be interesting to bring it to your attention. Well, speaking of beautiful things, it's not always the animals that are beautiful, but the earth is too. So let me send you over to David and see what he's got for you. Well, today's waterholes, landscapes, and other beautiful things. And we have the sun trying to set. Not yet, I would say. It's still bit early by like what, another uh, 10 minutes, uh, I reckon, before it goes down. But still, those clouds there is what I requested man we stop for because they look like very beautiful clouds for some rain. Uh, later on to come, it could be tonight or the next couple of days. Look at that. In Africa, we'll always have something to show you. I've always said it's not necessarily the animals, but also, you know, we've got wonderful sceneries. And in the background, what you see there is the old Lawrence Company. And because we are quite a distance from it, that's why you see uh, Manu capturing most of it. And Manu is the camera operator with me today. And oh, the trees you see there are the tortured trees, very iconic in East Africa and more so Kenya and Tanzania. Tanzania is the country south of Kenya. And of course, the beautiful savanna of the Mara Triangle. How lovely is that? Not once in a while we've seen lions walking, you know, through such grass. And I'm trying to wonder the particular prey they lost earlier where it would have gone. Magic Dragon, the best sunset I've ever seen, is right here in the Mara Triangle. And that could have been at the end of last year. And not sure I saw it right, but Magic Dragon, I thought that sunset took rather long to disappear. And I think even as it went down, I was left still watching and Magic Dragon. I hope you can see those egrets just flying across there. And I'm imagining uh, a sunset uh, Magic Dragon with such beautiful birds flying in front of a sunset. It would just be so magical to see. I've always said uh, Magic Dragon that sunsets and sunrises in Africa are very special. Not that they're not in any other part of the world, but what happens is when we see them, we have what they call very clear visuals, or we got what they call no visual pollution. Because for the last, I think, 45 seconds, three minutes, I mean, one minute or so, Manu has been trying to put this in frame. We haven't seen a car, a building, a plane. It's just nature, wilderness, and now again, the sun trying to push down. Amazing. 
Vincent, you say it's amazing, an amazing view. I agree with you, Vincent. And hopefully one day when you make your way here to Africa, you'll be lucky to see this. So what I'm going to do now is to turn around. And there's an area where my heart keeps telling me I might have passed those lions behind me. Well, the grass, you know, at the moment is quite tall. And you need to make one slight wrong turn and you miss them. Or they could even be, like, for example, right here, three meters from where I am. And if man is not standing, who has the advantage of the height uh, more than me when he's standing, We'll just miss them. But there's one turn I did, and I'm telling him, Manu, uh, my heart tells me we need to go back there and give it another shot. Because this particular pride, uh, we rarely see it. We rarely see it because it's quite far from the areas we cover, and we have particular characters of lions that we follow. And one is the Owino pride that Patrick has been following the last few days. Uh, Lowland, of course, have followed the Mogoro Pride and occasionally the Chelly Boys. Uh, we have seen of late she loves the, the hyenas, the North Clan. And of course, you all know I love the North Clan. So those are the kind of prides we tend to zero in on every day so that we can tell their stories backwards. But now, to see this particular pride today, and as I said before, it has pushed so much further north. I thought that was exciting. And it interrupted my plans of going to the Sausage Republic. And I'm saying, why don't I spend more time with them? Because they could become regulars, who knows? And if they do, we then have a few or more lions to compare with. What is the question again about other lions as they look for the road? See where I can turn from. Well, that's a good question. I would say, well, what should happen now? Um, the migration is gone. I'm sure you all know about the wildebeest and the zebras. They are all gone to Tanzania. And they did that uh, towards the end of last year. And basically they did that for calving, for calving to give birth to the, the young ones. And once the young ones are big, they are strong, they are able to come back. That's when, again, the migration will be here. But what I'm trying to say at the moment, there's a bit of scarcity of food, and it's what we call the green season. And when it's green season, then the lions have only one thing to do. They have to move a lot. They have to cover distances. And currently, they have been depending on very big prey, like buffaloes. Buffaloes are not as many, like the wildebeest or the zebras. And buffaloes also move. I would say buffaloes also migrate, not like the wildebeest, but they have what you call mini uh, migration. So the lions have to catch up. The lions have to fall with them because they may remain within their territory. So I wouldn't think they moved uh, because of other lions. I would say no. What I would say, that particular pride now, the Salt Lake pride, we saw there were three males, and Kipuli was one of them. I mean, those are three boys that could push any, you know, they could not be pushed around. So I got a feeling they just moved because of food. All right, I want to go back to where my heart tells me I took one wrong turn. I should have taken the other one. I took a left, I should have taken a right. And of course, now it's going to be a left. And who, who knows? JP, how are you today? And you have a very good question. How long would, or how far would the lions go from their cubs? Two reasons, two factors I'd say would come in play here. Number one, availability of food. Where are they going to get food? Of course, if it's a long way, they have no choice, they have to go. And I've seen lions going a whole six kilometers away from their cubs. I'm talking about four miles or so, looking for food. And of course, another factor would be how small, how big are their cubs. Of course, if they're very tiny, they have to be very careful not to go too far because anything would happen to them when they are away. So those are the two main factors that will determine how far they'd go. But just to give you an idea, anything six kilometers, 10 kilometers, it's very possible. So we are talking about uh, five miles, eight miles, you know, lions would walk to look for food. But as soon as it gets, they make their prey, 
if the Cubs can walk, they'll go bring them back. And if the three Lionesses are four making the kill, one or two will stay back guarding, of course, the kill. And the ones that will be going back for the Cubs, of course, they'll eat something small to give them energy to go for the Cubs. And I have seen that happening so very many times with the Associated Tree Pride, where they've made kills of buffaloes, and either one of them, I'm sure you know, the king's tail, our lioness will stay with the kill because she's very strong, very intelligent, and she, the rest of the team, will go to bring the uh, bring the cubs to the dining table. Feels so good now because the temperatures have gone down. When you know we started, it was so so very hot. Now I still got a feeling I might see one, two, or all those lions I had seen before. Very good. Do I take you back to Trish or Tristan, one of them, in Juma? Well, David, I can agree. The temperature has dropped nicely now. It's starting to get to that beautiful kind of time of the day where the light is gold and the temperature is good. And so it's a nice time to actually be out and about. I always enjoy being out at this time of the day. It always feels like things are going to start happening when you kind of at fairly quiet afternoon when it's so warm and then as you get to this kind of time you know that animals are going to start moving around so hopefully we're going to get lucky with something coming out and about um it's been fairly quiet even from a bird point of view you know we've been kind of looking around for birds and bar the odd cysticula here and there and starling and go away bird there's been very little else out this afternoon which is quite strange i would have thought in nice warm conditions like this we would have seen a few more birds and i was a bit sad that when we got to bufflesuk dam that our spoon bulls weren't there because it's been two spoon bulls that have been hanging around the bufflesuk dam quite a bit of late um, i really do enjoy the the spoon bulls they are very very pretty birds and love the way that they go about hunting and how successful they can be at hunting but essentially what we're doing now is it's still kind of water hole sort of searching um, even though it's cooled off quite a bit you might find still animals kind of coming down towards water points for that last drink of the day um, from a prey point of view and then from a predator point of view this is where they start coming down so just kind of actively doing little sort of loops around and just checking to see if there's any sign Craig was saying to me though this morning he was with Sydney and they had a brief view of Tundi well not brief view but they followed Tundi for a little bit and um, he was saying that it was really tricky because even when she was walking in the grass all you could see was just ears and so you know a cat that lies down in the grass at the moment it's not going to be easy unless you've got a, a track that you can actually trail into a block and try and find her like that you it's going to be a bit of a struggle to spot them um, so what we're hoping for is because it's also cooled down a little bit maybe some of them will be up on mounds or you know, potentially just moving around a little bit which will help us not only from catching a movement point of view out of the corner of your eye because in this grass sometimes that's what gives them away is a bit of movement but also being in places that are a little bit easier to see so you know termite mounds being raised slightly out the top of the grass certainly helps with being able to spot what's going on but hopefully we'll get something we're gonna just back at twin dams now Alex, um, is it easier or more difficult to find leopards in, in brown grass? I think that's what I heard. Um, easier, I'll tell you why. Because brown grass is generally associated with winter. Now winter is when the grass starts to die back, water becomes a lot harder to find, and the sort of pathways between the grass start to develop where you can actually get soft little bits of soil and they act as little track traps if you want to call them that um, and so tracking becomes a lot easier and, and the leopards themselves because as that grass dries and becomes more brown that seed layer on top starts to dissipate um, and the grass actually becomes almost thinner so I find in winter it's actually easier um, generally the leopard stands taller than what the grass is whereas in summer when it's the grass has grown to its sort of maximum height and it's seeding it becomes very dense and thick and the leopard's coat is obviously designed to camouflage very well and so it becomes quite tricky to see them um, in summer so I always find it easier in the brown grass than I do in, in this green